and size, and whenever anybody from the native code, from the frozen code, calls size, I want to call this particular implementation. There is actually an in this intelligence here. Just look at this one, actually. It says, whenever anybody calls is a small integer on any object, I want to use this uh, implementation. And that's because the same name can be used for different type of classes, right? So we, we need to have some kind of dispatcher, some kind of lookup if you want. We don't. So and, and, and I'm going to explain that in the next slide. And, and so we have different uh, different ways to tell the freezer what we want to actually put into the executable file. And I'm going to come back to these last ones because it's quite interesting there. Just at the end. So this is pretty much how the normal lookup works. Uh, there is a central dispatching point unless you have already called the method and there's cache in place. But so um, the, the dispatcher changes the class for an object and if it's that object uh, it, it, if it's the right class it actually calls the method and otherwise triggers a lookup. That's when you already have some kind of cache in place. Okay, so the first time the lookup is used and then the call is patched to go to this faster version that works just uh, with one particular class and otherwise makes a lookup. So since we, we don't really want to have a very dynamic lookup because we don't want to implement method lookup in the first place, like the first days, we want to see, but we still want to have of course, polymorphism. So what we did is we we are chaining the lookup. So when one fails, it goes to the next class check. Okay. So and so we can chain ten different class checks, each one with uh, one for one particular class and with one particular implementation. So if we go back to the previous slide, slide one where we can tell the nativize what methods we want to nativize. This is what builds this multiplexer. We call it. So it's, it enters in one single entry point and checks for the class and multiplex. But why are you using a, a list instead of a hash or something? I mean, because then... This is all code. It's executable code. Ah, there's, there's no data, right? So this is chaining code, actually. Yeah, but you could have a table. Yes, we could have a table. Huh? But we decided to go for code. Because if you have 10... Well, 10 no, it, has to do from, from, it has to do from where we, where, where we can. We are implementing, I'm going to come to this back later, we're implementing all this to, we're implementing all this in small talk, right? Um, we're, we're using it one particular small talk. And this particular small talk that we use, uh, the way this particular small talk <coughs> thinks leads us to use this implementation, okay? I'm, I'm going to come back to this later. Uh, so, then we added the Default. Here you can see the default for one particular method. This is again not correct code, but it, it means that whenever every class check fails, call this particular implementation. This let, lets us uh, set one particular implementation for every object in the system without having a huge multiplexer. Okay, and then we add. We we realize we need one particular method for each small integer because. It's small integer do not have the class slot in the object. So we add one particular uh, way to add methods to small integer. And again, this is all code. It translates directly to code. So after we tried this, we had this idea a while back, but we couldn't try it because we, we didn't have the, the sheet already finished. So once we finished the JIT, we could try this idea. We tried it. It was all in memory. We could create code in memory and use it, but not on files. So we thought, okay, it looks like we could go a little bit further. So what's a little bit further? Well, the motor VM. Okay, and everybody wants to write its own VM, so do we. And everybody wants to write it a little bit harder, a little bit trickier, so we do too. And we want to write a small talk. Okay, so we want to write a small talk VM in small talk. Okay, and there is one particular, two more interesting things to say about this. 
we want it to be compatible with this Smalltalk we are using. This is, we, like, we could write any Smalltalk VM with Smalltalk, but we want it to be compatible to the Smalltalk we are using to write it. Because we want to take as much advantage of, this, of the environment as we can. Okay, so this has to do a lot with our development strategy. We don't want to write a VM and then just test it at the end. We want to have a full VM working all the time. So we're going to start with the VM we are using to run our system, our program, and we're going to slowly replace things on this VM using the environment as a context to run our VM. So for example, we're going to use the primitives from this VM to run our VM. And in the first days, we're going to use the garbage collector of this VM to run our VM. And we're going to use the shit to run our VM. But we're pretty soon replaced this bit with our bit. And then hopefully we can replace the garbage collector with our garbage collector. And so on. And replace our metal lookup. And replace more and more things. And I think we actually wrote a VM in small time. Because that's what we want to do, right? But we want to do it interactively and test at every step and test the full system at every step because we want to run tests, like test cases, written in smart. So we need a full VM to run it, but we want to run in our own VM and our own VM is not ready. So how do we do it? <laughs> right? So we use the VM we're using as support for our VM. We're, we're fully using the framework this environment gives us. Okay? And that's a little bit from why we thought of writing these multiplexers as code because we're coming from this compatibility and using the environment, right? So there are lots of things to do when you write a VM and we don't really still, we still don't know all the things we need to do but we certainly need to generate executable files because we want to write them executable, right? We, we will eventually have to do some method lookup. We do have our toy method lookup with these multiplexers, and it's working pretty well. We need to understand the object format. We need to do garbage collection and all memory management things. We need primitives. We need foreign function interface. We need processes, callbacks, whatever the future brings us, right? We need the full VM. So uh, for method lookups, we now, now are using our multiplexers for primitives. We're using the primitives from the environment, from the development environment. For file and function interface, we, we, we are using two different things. Uh, we implemented our own. Uh, I'm going to go back to that later, and it's important to understand. Uh, well, it's a detail, but it's interesting to understand it. And then for the rest, we still don't have the rest. Processes, we're using the environment process. Callbacks, yeah, same thing. Uh, for garbage collection, I want to show you the demo right now, and you won't see anything, hopefully, right? That's when demos work. You won't see anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, apparently it did work, and as I said, you don't notice anything, right? <laughs> We're going to come back to this later. But what we, I just did is I installed our garbage collector in the system and replace the garbage collector of the system with our own and the system continue running. Okay? So a big part of this, we, we were like going after we finished writing the chess and tank compiler, that was the last time here, we were like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. We want to generate executable files. That took us like, I don't know, three months, four months. It was like huge, huge and we thought, like, yeah, let's drop an exit file there, and that's it. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Like, first, generating exits is not easy, but luckily, we took the long road, and we implemented lots of things. We implemented how to generate imports, exports, and actually, we have, like, a linker. Like, we can import symbols that we export ourselves, and then the big antivisor solves all this, and that's an executable file. And this turned out to be very interesting. So, for example, uh, I can show you like what we have uh, for executable files, uh, also the tests. Like here, you see it's like class of classes, okay? Like all the HC and relocations, 
directories, like everything. So, but it turned out that one of the last things we needed for the GC is to uh, reclaim more memory from the OS. And to do that, you need to call the OS. So, we, all we had, we could just code these, we call them under primitives. So they are coded in this assembly slam. So it says, this, all the slides here are lying a little bit, okay? Well, all the code you see here is real, but for example, this one is lacking the initialization. But that, that kind of thing, so it's easier to understand. Yes, and, okay, I'm gonna go back to that later. Yes, that, that's an interesting detail. So this one loads an argument from the context. Uh, uh, that, that's because this, this under primitive takes an argument and converts this argument to native format because it's a small talk, a small integer and I want to call the function so I need to convert it to native. Uh, what he just said is that we actually here not just convert but check that the argument is an integer. And if it's not, we just exit this under primitive. That's one of the simplifications we are doing here to show you. So when then we push this argument and and, and convert to native the receiver and push the receiver and push four, four and six, again the argument, again the receiver and call to virtual log from kernel 32. That's gonna add an import like this. <coughs> very simple code is gonna add an import to the execute of file, call it from here, add the champ table and all the things we need to do. So it took us a lot of time to do it, but it actually paid because we can now do this kind of FFI. And we actually don't want to go through full primitives to do parameter marshalling. 10 minutes already. Okay? So it's his time. Um, Probably, then we finish. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, for our network connector, we need the spaces. Uh, we are going to use three one for the old space and two for the cube spaces. And uh, what does uh, the space know? Okay, it knows the content, which is the actual data, and the base, which is the address of the content. Uh, the next three, which is the position to group the next object, um, well, the commit limit, which is the actual commit data limit, and some result limit. Um, um, okay, we can ask to the space some some things like does this 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 is space includes an object and the implementation is quite straightforward and we are not lying there that's the actual implementation uh, we can ask to reset the, the space which is only telling the space to set the base address into the next free to the base address and we can ask if some object is referring to the space which is very useful um, ah, we can do a shallow copy. Oh, okay. We can do a shallow copy which makes a shallow copy of the object into the space. Uh, okay. <coughs> then we have a hierarchical GC. Um, to do a collect is very easy, just follow the rules. Okay, we are going to have some rules and the three spaces. Uh, we follow the rules, walk the stack, and then we rescue ephemerals and trailers with containers. And finally, keep the spaces. Okay, that's very easy. Um, okay, we can ask, we, we have some private method for the clipper, like push rules, because Roots are full of false positive roots, and that's very expensive to work. Uh, we can follow an object, we can move to all or two space, uh, and we can fix reference. I am going to, to return to this data. And also we can have an interrupt after we finish the, the flip. So, Follow root and walk start code to this function, which is follow option. Um, it's very easy. It's a, okay, just follow this.
this subject for all those fields starting at zero. And it's, it's not like I'm mean, using zero ways, the zero refers to the mental dictionary array, which has to be actually checked and moved. And if the object has some width, we have to remember the object because we are going to do something later. And um, this is what the photo can start now. <coughs> and it only say, okay, for each field, check if this field is in the front space. And if true, just move to all or two. And where to move depends on the generation of the object. But there's something tricky. We're calling the, from the point of view of the generation of the garbage collector, we're calling the subspaces from and to. Okay, like it would be new and flip. On, but from the perspective of the GZ, we call it from and to. Uh, well, we don't want to move twice the same object, so once the object is moved, we change the object into a proxy. Um, if we found a proxy, we took the proxy object and we use that object. Uh, we do a patch there. Um, okay, that's uh, that's about weak container. Weak container are very easy. We only follow all the weak containers and we follow the fields. If we found that the field is included in from space and is preferred uh, and is a proxy, okay, we just use the proxy and we do a patch. If, if not, then no one is referring to this week, so we set a thumbstamp and use the receive option. Well, ephemerance is a bit more complicated and we will make the highest paper on ephemerance.
meter, meter. It's, it creates a new generation with the space. Uh, this space is actually for local storage for the GC because the GC cannot really call new what is in GC. Excuse me. Now, now if you see the original VM, is that right? Now there isn't the original VM. This is all the original VM. The original VM. But as soon as I do, that. do this, yes. we are going to be using uh, our GC with the original VM as support in the environment. Okay. This, this is not the. Uh, we, we have not implemented the Marco Swift, so this is just the, the flip right? the generation, with this generation. So we create an ELL, and somewhere we we get the DLL, we, we get the address of the compile method in the DLL. We are need to skip the class check because we don't want to use the class check, and that is set the flip. That that last instruction is going to change the flipper for the we are using right now. So this is all the <coughs> runtime, real time. So let's try something else. Let's add one local variable, one variable to the DC and count how many objects are moved from <coughs> one space to the other during the DC. So in collect, we initialize it to zero. Right? This is collect. It, is, it does what we say it does. Follows the names are a little bit different, but for the root, both the stack, the speed of femurals, speed of spaces. Uh, then we go to copy an object to another space. This is called when it needs to move either from the new space to the old to the old space or to the flip space, right? So it's whenever it, whenever an object survives. So we here increment the count by one. Uh, let's add an accessor. Save uh, in the library. Um, okay. Never try to destroy the since demos are meant to fail. Now I have just installed the GC. It's supposed to be running our GC, right? So let's bring something to the transcript every time it flips and let's bring the count. So uh, now, if you ask me the question, is running RGC. Yeah, that's right. So, so how do you access that? <laughs> how do you access the instance of that GC? Well, it, it's a there's a, it's a single one. Okay. So I, I just I just okay. do uh, like
flag the other generation in the auction theater. That would have been the biggest challenge. Yes? Slow. <laughs> no, we haven't done any benchmarks. We do have one particular bug that makes no sense. We actually need to make any benchmarks right now. And is that we're having more flips than the original VM does. I don't know why. We don't understand why. But there are more flips. When we install our GC, there are more flips. And we don't really understand why. We think it's like, we finished this like two weeks ago. Okay? So, is, we think we're leaving some pointer wrong somewhere, so it thinks it needs to flip again. But it's not like continuously flipping. <coughs> but it's flipping a lot more. So, in this lower, for that, for sure, then we have our, like, to access the auction flags, to access the auction feeder, we have other primitives. So, right, so we don't really actually do EAX minus 4 to access the flags. We call it function that does that. Because it's implemented as another primitive. Very simple, there's a function call. So that adds another layer of calls that's, that's going to make it slower. Our idea is to inline those calls. It should be straightforward. A little bit hard, but, but it's pretty clear which one we need to use inline. So for those two things, it's slower. We're not copying the content. So we're just flipping pointers. That should give us some advantage. Right. Uh, but right now, it's slower. There's, there's no doubt. We cop, it shouldn't be that. And uh, then we, we could closure the closed set of methods we need to navigate so it's self-contained, right? So we have a lot of code. We, we do use arrays in our code. And when we navigate, we need to do everything we're going to use. For the GC, it's pretty simple because it's just uh, under primitive, for says the option files, and we will use arrays and a little bit some other stuff, but it's very, very simple things. Our, our big navigators, our big advisor says, like, raises an exception with all the undefined symbols we're calling. So we, if we don't explicitly say that we want to use the symbol for things we are not not advising, it doesn't know how to do it. So we actually do know we think what things we need to include. But we want to do some automatic thing that finds everything, every method we need to find the closure. It's more just, we call it closure over method sets. So, because we, we need the minimum set of methods that's going to work for us. We need to work on that for the just in time compiler. Um, continue with memory management, implement new. We do have shallow copy, which is kind of a cheap new, because you don't, not, you don't need to find out what flags to put in the header. So, we use, we use a very shallow copy for new. We need to implement new, we want to implement become. And then we want to, want to continue doing microsweep and implement method lookup and try different strategies and continue. I don't know. Um, <coughs> that's it. So that's it. Questions? Thank you. <laughs>
but not the anything special. So when you're generating the executable, do you something similar to Slang or the code will be compared to it? No, it's a small term. The code we show you is the code of GC. When you generate it to executable, it's not something that can form or just no no, it's a small where what where we we started with the with the just in time compiler. So the just in time compiler can translate bytes to a summary. Okay. And that's the compiler also. Yeah, not it's only it's just in time compiler. So we're using that compiler to do the frozen code. And, and when you have your, for example, your GC working, can you debug the GC? Or you, you, what? I mean, yes, there are two, three different answers to that. And it's, it's native code. And it does not have the hooks for calling the debugger. When you compile something in the no, mode, let's say that you're not using the that device. Yeah. Right, using if, if you want to just divide it, divide it in small code, you could. However, the GC is the, like, you, you can divide the just in time compiler, there's no problem with that. The GC will leave the space in but, intermediate steps, that, yeah. that's going to crash pretty yeah. soon. Yeah. Right. But, but have you thought about having like a kernel? Right. What well, well, we thought is about what, all the interface to the object structure is implemented as these under primitives. So what we thought is about doing a hierarchy of objects with one class probably that implements these under primitives like uh, flags, size, uh, method to generate array, like just accessing look, uh, instance variables, right? So then you could debug the, the GC because it's not going to change the actual object, it's going to change some local variables that can keep the state. We, have, we haven't done that yet, and we do want to do it. That's one of the next steps, because uh, we do want to be back. Which is some maybe the same thing about interpreter simulation. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, it, it, it's kind of that, but since uh, what, what, this is the, the, the GC we want to debug. So it's a little bit different. The, but the GC does create its different space, memory <coughs> space, and does that. We could do that too, actually. If we, if we, if we were debugging, the GC in our own space where the real GC does not run, then we could do that. The problem is that we're going to tweak flags in the headers and then the GC is going to be far in the middle and that option is going to be invalid. And then the GC is just crashing. There are really strong environments about the flags. It's kind of delicate to change real flags, but we do want to solve that somehow. We want to debug the GC. We actually do debug the GC, but it's not like you can debug everything. But why didn't you do the same thing as Dan did with Scoria? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, well, I'm not, like having a, a, our own space? No, no, like, <laughs> no, like having a simulator. <coughs> and run. Uh, our simulator is small, right? No, they're not going to do that. So, as, a, as I understood you, compiling the application and running it on And it's not working, but repeat, please. Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, he said he he, he he asked me if what we're doing is generating a DLL. Uh, we are taking small to code, real small to code, <coughs> compiling it to bytecode, using the chassis time compiler to change the bytecode into assembly, putting all this assembly into a DLL, loading the DLL using the operating system, which is part of our environment that we use. We load the DLL. Uh, into the environment we're using, <coughs> get a, a, a get use the proc address to get the address of the entry point for the GC and change the flipper of the VM we're using as environment for our flipper. And uh, what we want to do is somehow not working, but what we want to do and it should work is we can load one DLL, test the GC, unload the DLL using the normal GC, change <coughs> the GC, load another DLL, test it. Save it, drop it, load another one. So we have a, a dynamic environment where we can test a new GC if it doesn't crash uh, without restarting, right? It's kind of weird that it won't crash, but mm -hmm. I feel like it. <laughs> Why did you choose not to uh, write the symbol tables to access the GC from uh, the native debug? It should be that difficult. Uh, you do so much about the operating system setting up the, the DLLs correctly. So I think it should be a small step to write also the symbol tables and debugger command. Oh, to use another debugger. We do that. We do that. We can use the uh, whatever. We, we, we the actually debugger. do that. Yeah. We do use a native debugger. Okay. We do. <laughs> and the DLL has every symbol you can wish. Yeah. Like
like every method has its own symbol, and the, the symbol exported by the DLL is class name, greater than, greater than, hash, method name. For every single method, um, um, and we use it a lot. We do use it a lot. Yes. So the test methods you were showing when you run those tests, is that just all simulated in Smalltalk, or is it running the native class? Well, that, that, that's what we have tried to explain here, and I know it's a little bit complicated. That, the, the, me, the test method we show you first is that one up there. It says create new space, create a new flipper, take the from space from the flipper, um, populate it. Okay. But we want to test that as real native code. So we have this kind of testing facilities that will actually execute this block. Uh, in the in the deal lab. so this this uh, this super syntax or method whatever we do a lot of stuff. We create a deal lab. We notify so the GC create a deal lab, add an entry point for the test, and then execute the block, proxy this this object the front space for the flipper into the block. So we sort of create a parallel object memory that doesn't affect the. Uh, in in this case, yeah. we do create a parallel object memory. We have other tests that work on the real object. Well, uh, these are the kind of the first tests when we were breaking everything. Then we were when we were safer. We actually use the objects, the real objects. So the other session is supposed to start. Okay. Well, we can continue outside.